Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. After we discussed traditional System 5 IPC in our last video, we'll now move on to the form of IPC that we use the most, day in day out, and which provides the basis for so much of the Unix philosophy of building small tools that operate as filters, handling text streams, and operating on standard in and standard out. The Unix pipe. With the pipe syscall. The pipe itself is one of the oldest and most common forms of IPC. It's similar to what we've seen in our System 5 IPC discussion, the kernel structure, which provides unidirectional communications by offering a read end and a write end. The pipe syscall takes as argument an array of file descriptors which it will connect to the read and write end of this newly created pipe. Okay, so after calling pipe, this is what this looks like. FD1 points to the write end of the pipe, and FD0 to the read end of the pipe. But this by itself is of course not useful at all. In order to be able to perform inter-process communication, you actually need another process. How do we get another process? We fork. After we called fork, we know that the new process is a near identical copy of the parent process. So of course it also gets a copy of the file descriptors of the pipe. Now each process, the parent and the child, have a copy and can use the file descriptors to perform I.O. However, since the pipe is unidirectional, both processes have to agree on which process does the reading and which process does the writing. By convention, each process then closes the file descriptor that it is not going to use, and we end up with our inter-process communications channel looking like this. The parent process on the left closed the read end of the pipe and can write into the pipe while the child on the right closed the right end of the pipe, ready to read data from the parent. Here, let's look at an example. We're basically replicating an echo pipe cat pipeline. First, we call pipe, and then we fork. In the parent, we close the read end of the pipe, print off a few messages to send it out, that is, not into the pipe, then use write to print a message to be delivered to the child process through the pipe. In the child process, we close the write end of the pipe, print for our own message, then read the message from the parent and write it to standard out. At the end, both processes call wait and exit. When we run the program, we now see the message from the parent which is reporting its parent PID as process ID 41, which is the PID of our shell. The child process reports its parent PID 2132, then reports sending a message to the child. The child process reports reading the message, then writes it to standard out. Now, let's see what happens when we write our output into our pipe ourselves. Now note that the message written by the child, which it received from its parent process, is written out first, and we see the printf messages from the child first, then those of the parent, which is in contrast to what we saw right before. Why do we have different output here? Well, remember that we are mixing printf and write calls, and recall from our earlier discussion that printf is buffered I.O while write is unbuffered. When standard out is connected to a terminal, it is line buffered, so any time a carriage return is encountered, the buffer is flushed. But when standard IO is connected to a pipe, it is no longer line buffered, and instead the default standard out buffer size applies. So the data written by our program will appear out of order than what we might expect from interactive views. Recall also that we do not know whether the child or the parent will execute first after we call fork but that the dynamics of our program necessarily enforce an order of completion. The child necessarily will wait until the parent is done writing data, as it's reading the data from the pipe. The parent, however, necessarily will wait for the child to complete after it has written the data, as we explicitly called wait before we exit. Now what would happen if we didn't wait for the child process to complete? Let's comment this out 
and see what happens. Now when we run this, we notice that our shell returns to the prompt before the child has had a chance to print its message. But what if we pipe the output into a pipe again? Look at that! Now the parent completes first, since it doesn't have to wait for the child. Then the child writes its message from the parent, and then the child reports its PID and parent PID. But note that when the child is writing its message into the send out buffer, when it calls get ppid, that reports a parent PID of 1, even though the parent process was 2061. This illustrates that we all, what we also remember from week 6. When a child process is still running after its parent has exited, it is read by init, process ID 1, which then becomes the orphan's new parent. If you run this program often enough, you may even observe the case where the child process will report the expected parent PID in one statement, and then report process 1 as its parent in the second statement. Ok, so we've learned how we can communicate between two processes using a pipe. But often, we do not want to implement all the code on both sides of the pipe. Instead, we want to communicate with another program altogether. That is, we want to execute another program and pipe data into it, allowing it to receive the data on standard in, without us having to change the program. Let's simulate this in this code example. Specifically, we're going to emulate piping data into a pager. By convention, many programs honor the pager environment variable, which might point to a program to invoke to, for example, read the manual page. If that pager is unset, most commands will then default to the more command. So what we'll do with the program pipe2.c is implement exactly this command right here. We cat a file into the user chosen pager command, defaulting to user bin more if that variable is not set. Ok, so let's see. We f open the file we're given and then call pipe and fork. In the parent, we close the read end of the pipe and then continue to read input from our file handler and write it to the write end of the pipe. In the child, we close the write end of the pipe and then call dupe2 to duplicate the read end of the pipe onto the standard in file descriptor, thereby redirecting standard in. This has the effect that now our child process, or any program it may exact later, will, when it reads from standard in, in fact read from the pipe read handle. Next, we check if the user has a pager set in the environment and produces suitable argv0 or use the default pager if not. Then we call exactlp, knowing that our pager is connected to our pipe, allowing the bytes from the parent to become standard in of the program we are executing. So when we execute this program, it does what we expect. It pipes the file we give it into the default pager. More. Now, if we suspend this program, we can see the processes, with process ID 14857 being the parent process and process 24718, the child process, executing more. But this program also gives us an opportunity to explore how using settings from the environment can change how your program behaves. We had intentionally written our program to allow the user to choose the pager, thereby allowing for some flexibility. Here, let's set the pager to cat. While our program now is perhaps not very useful, we'll see that we are able to execute this other program and again it will receive data on standard in from our pipe. There. But we can of course use any other program capable of reading data from standard in. Say WC. So this is useful. We basically illustrated just how the shell implements inter-process communication for its pipelines.
And when we looked at the output of PS, we saw which program was executed. But remember that our code included a short comment, and that when we talked about exec in the previous video, we mentioned that we can specify argv0, the name of the program? Here, let's take a look. Suppose we set argv0 to be tar. Then regardless of what program we are actually executing, it will show up in our process table as tar. Let's do that. Since our pager environment variable is unset, we will execute the default pager, more. If we then suspend the process and look at the process table, then we see the command listed as tar, even though clearly it is not that. In other words, you can trust the process table only to some degree. Now, our program here, where we create a pipe and then write data into a second program, is something that is needed quite often. Likewise, you could imagine the inverse, a program that executes another program and then reads the output from that program. Both are very common use cases, and so of course we actually have a library function available for us that does all that. Enter popen. Popen will create a pipe connected to the command that is to be executed and return a file stream for you to consume. So it's kind of useful to be able to read and write from another process. This is nowadays usually implemented not using a pipe but a socket, which is what we will discuss in our next video. To tell the function whether you like the read or the write end of the pipe, you specify R or W. If you want both, add a plus. The command you pass to popen is executed not directly, however. Instead, the function executes bin sh, and then hands the shell the command. That has a few important and perhaps surprising side effects. For one thing, this allows for expansion of all shell meta characters, including file globbing, for example. But it also means that if you're not careful, your program can be abused to execute additional commands. For that reason, NetBSD has an additional variation of this function that combines the exact call with the redirection of the I.O. stream, popenve. That, however, is non-standard and only mentioned here for completeness sake, since NetBSD is our reference platform. But let's look at a few examples. Our program here implements pretty much what we had before, piping a file into a pager. But note that this time around, we don't need to call pipe or fork. Instead, we simply call popen, and can then easily write our data into the program. Here we go. This time we prefix the output with some arrows, but otherwise the program behaves exactly the same. And if we set the pager to cat, for example, we are also not surprised by the results. Same if we set it to wc. But now let's set our pager to a sequence of commands. When we run the program now, it will dutifully pipe the contents of the file into more, but it will also execute the other commands since the contents of the pager environment variable are passed to a shell to execute via popen. So after our program has completed, we should find that it did indeed execute the id command. And there you have it. This pattern is actually a very common security vulnerability. Many programming languages support a popen equivalent, and all too often do not verify the command that is passed to this function, not remembering that it is passed on to a shell. You can find countless bug bounty reports of vulnerability disclosures that center around this particular way of exploiting unvalidated user input, and so this should serve to you as a reminder to a avoid popen and use something like popenve or other parameterized execution methods, 
and b to always verify that what you're passing into a shell doesn't contain shell meta characters or otherwise can lead to the execution of additional commands or perform file io etc okay so we've seen the use of the pipe and we know that it can allow related processes to communicate but what if we want to have unrelated processes to exchange information for that we can use a fifo a fifo is also known as a named pipe it behaves much like a pipe, but it allows unrelated processes to communicate. Because it is actually manifested in the file system. That is, it exists as a file of type FIFO and thus allows processes to read from or write to it. As such, all the usual file I.O. operations work almost just as on a regular file. And you create a FIFO via the make FIFO syscall shown here. But why is a FIFO useful? Couldn't we just create a normal file and let the processes read from and write to that? Well, the advantage of a FIFO is that the data does not actually end up on disk and it is consumed in sequence as it is written to the FIFO. Its usefulness is best illustrated by an example. Suppose you have a process that you wish to connect to not one single process, but two. That is, you want two commands to process the output of a program. We can do that. There is no way to pipe data into two programs. So you'd have to run the command multiple times. But if we create a FIFO and we have a tool that duplicates input it reads to a file as well as to standard out, then we can create a pipeline that allows for data to flow into two programs. The program we need to facilitate this is T. T is called T because it looks like a T. Data goes in on one end and comes out on two ends. But what about the FIFO? Well, with T we can only duplicate its input to a file. But oftentimes you do not wish to create an intermediate file. Perhaps you're processing large amounts of data and simply don't have the disk space to store the intermediate duplicate copy of the data. So instead of asking T to write to a file, we ask it to write to a FIFO and our second consumer can then read the data from the FIFO. This may sound a bit confusing when you're just looking at these illustrations here and have never used T, so let's try to make things clearer by showing an example. Here we have a bunch of log files from our web server. The entries look like this. One line per hit where the ninth field shows the HTTP status code. So if we want to separate all our logs into entries that were successful, that had a 200 HTTP status code, and those that did not, then we have to decompress all of these files and grab out the lines with 200 into one file. And then decompress all of these files again to grab out all those not matching our pattern. In other words, we're performing rather expensive I.O. and CPU work twice. Let's see if we can improve the situation by using a FIFO. Let's create one of those. It looks like this. Type is P for named pipe, and the size is always zero, as a FIFO does not store any data, only allows it to flow between processes. So how can we take advantage of this? Let's start our first grab process, but place it in the background. The invocation will now block. as no data has been written into the FIFO. But now we can uncompress our log files and have T duplicate the data into the FIFO. Then add the inverse grab in this pipeline. After this completes, our background pipeline will also have completed. And our results are identical to the ones we had produced earlier. Okay, time to recap. Pipes and FIFOs are the oldest forms of IPC and form the basis of the Unix philosophy of building filters and operating on text streams. As we've seen, we can only use pipes between related processes, as the pipe system call produces the pair of file descriptors and you need to fork a new process to allow them to share the communication endpoints.
FIFOs, on the other hand, allow us to have unrelated processes communicate with one another. We noted that pipes are not line, but fully buffered. And after you've created a pipe, it's conceivable that you fork multiple times, yielding possibly multiple readers or writers. This may not seem like a desirable situation, but the pipe at least guarantees you that the data from a single writer is not interleaved with the data of another writer for up to pipe buff chunks. Practically though, it's rare that you have such a setup, and instead would likely prefer having multiple pipes or some other form of IPC for this scenario. Now what happens when you close one end of the pipe? If you close the right end of the pipe, then the consumer will simply get zero bytes from it on the next read. But if you're trying to write to a pipe where the reader has disappeared, then you will receive a signal, sick pipe. You can of course catch or ignore that signal as we discussed in our earlier video. If you do that, then the write to such a broken pipe will yield an error with Erno set to ePipe. This concludes our coverage of Unix pipes and FIFOs, but of course we have a lot more to say about other IPC. In particular, in our next videos we'll discuss socket pairs and sockets, both in the local domain and then in the network context. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.